So all week we have been talking about accelerators and talking about incubators and we've been talking about building your business and building your team and talking to investors and pitching and networking and all of that great stuff. And then this morning we had Charmaine talking all about the Waira way of doing things. And this afternoon you are you are privileged and indeed honoured, especially since Carlos is currently going through a selection process, to have a huge crew of people who run what I think are probably the best incubators in London. Um, and you have, I mean, it's, it's quite actually quite unusual to get all of you in the same room together at the same time. Um, what I'm going to do is each of them are going to basically say who they are and where they come from and just do five minutes on theirs. And then we're going to open it up to have some conversations about lovely ideas such as innovation and entrepreneurship and um, all that sort of malarkey, investment challenges. And then you guys will also have a chance to ask your questions of them. Um, it really is quite a diverse and each has their own flavor and different ways of doing things. And that is quite unusual. But I'm going to start with the fantastic uh, John Bradford who's going to talk a little bit about Techstars, aren't you, John? I am going to talk about Techstars. Um, Techstars uh, was the very first original mentor-led accelerator program uh, set up in 2007 in Boulder. Um, we now exist in 10 different locations, nine of which are in the US, and one is here in London, uh, which opened uh, its doors about uh, eight weeks ago. Um, we're in week nine, eight, nine of the program. We've got three weeks to go before our demo day. Um, kind of the stats on a high level are up until the end of last year, we had 200 teams through our program. We're probably incubating now something of the order of 120 to 150 teams across those different locations a year. Uh, total amount raised uh, is about one point five million dollars per team, so total about three hundred million dollars. Um, this is not going to be the last location outside of the US and we're going to keep moving. Um, uh, we have a 90% hit rate in terms of teams which get funded and 10% of our teams have already exited. Do you want to just, I mean I think this is probably true for all of you, if you could also just say kind of what it is you offer and maybe if, if you do invest, how much you invest, yeah. that would be great. Um, so we invest in total, about $120,000, uh, which includes um, a 6% equity stake and a loan note, uh, which is unusual outside of the US. Um, we physically keep people in a room for 13 weeks uh, during lock the, lock the door. Um, the reason why pizzas are so slim is because you can push them under the door for developers. Um, they actually have access to the property for up to eight months for, for free. Um, yeah, that's it. And Carlos. Just out of curiosity, how many of you are actively applying to an accelerator at, at the moment? Okay. How many of you have already submitted the application or are just thinking about it? How many have submitted an application? Thinking. thinking. Okay, some thinkers. Okay. So Seed Camp uh, has been around uh, pretty much the same time as Techstars because we started in 2007. Um, based here in London, uh, made for Europe effectively. Um, a big difference that we have, let's say, from uh, um, uh, the American approach is that what we do is we take the approach of finding companies where they're, where they're starting, which includes obviously a lot of countries that don't necessarily always have a chance to come to London as the next step in their company's development. So weird stat. We are the largest investor in Estonian companies outside of the Estonian government, for example. So, you know, a third of our co companies come from Eastern Europe. Um, we have 93 companies in total. Um, the, we, we have 83% of them raise follow on funding um, as part of being our program. Our program is therefore, because it's tailored towards the European ecosystem and the challenges that Europeans have, we're really focusing on providing them with an ongoing support program. It doesn't really ever end. Um, it is true that intensive part of it tends to happen within the first two, three months, but we have companies since 2007 that are still pinging us and being part of our program and being involved. 
So once you're part of the family, you're always part of the family. And in terms of investment and equity yes. and that sort of stuff? Yes, so um, our aggregate amount to invest is up to, I think in dollars it's up to $70,000 for roughly 8 to 10%, but we have different investment options depending on what the company needs. And you have a physical space where people will stay? True, thanks for reminding me. Um, we have a Google Campus, which many of you have, may have been to. So it's, it's here in Shoreditch. Uh, the company sit really next to us. It's very, diff it's very similar to how other programs have the companies next to, to us. So we have a lot of teams fly in, spend time with us. We also share with them 150,000 euros worth of value via our Founders Pack. And they join what we call our Seed Camp Academy, which is the, the training program that includes the Founders Pack, includes the mentorship, and includes the, the real estate. And then. Hi guys. <laughs> one, one of the cool things about this week has been how many of you have kept turning up to every single one of the sessions that we've, um, we've led. So thank you so much, guys. So I'll do the two minute pitch because I've been teaching you how to do that all week. Um, two minutes. Wira started just over two years ago. Our first academy was opened in Bogota in Colombia. We operate wherever Telefonica is present at the moment, and that means we have 14 academies globally, seven in Latin America, seven across Europe. We've invested in just over 260 startups in a little over two years, which is pretty phenomenal growth. Um, so far, we're a lot younger. We're the new kid on the block in comparison to the two guys to my right. Um, but so far, we have 19 out of those 260-odd startups that are no longer trading. Our failure rate is kind of low, similar to the guys as well have said. Um, but the difference, I guess, really, that's, that's sort of unique and makes Wire slightly different is the access to Telefonica's potential customer base and equally the access to our suppliers, our experts that, that live within our business. Similar to what Carlos just described as well, for us, Wira really is a family. Um, some of you have had the chance to meet a few of our startups in the Wira Street and over with the internship stand. We genuinely care about the success of your business. We will move mountains to try and make sure that you get access to the right people and to make sure that we can give you the information that you need to see whether or not your startup's going to have any legs. I think the other couple of things I would very quickly say. Number one, Telefonica is doing this largely because we're frustrated. We're frustrated that people think that the only place that you can do a digital startup is to go to San Francisco. It's not true. We want Silicon Valleys all over the world. So that's why we built those startups and startup academies in the places we have. And number two, we genuinely think that digital and the digital economy is the future of our business as well. So Telefonica genuinely does learn from you as startups to take that thinking back into our core business as well. So for us, you know, digital is not just you and your success, it's also ours. Do you want to mention the investment piece and whether cool. you have so a yeah, the, So what we offer, it's a six month program. We Averagely um, invest 40,000 euros in each startup, but similar to Carlos mentioned, if you are much later stage and you're a little bit further along, you've got external investment, then we will take that into account. So if we need to put more money in to take our between 5 to 10% equity, then we will. Mentoring, coaching, access to the experts within Telefonica, potential access to our customer base, which direct customers is over 300 million worldwide indirectly with our partners in places like Italy, China, et cetera. It's over a billion. Thank you. And Diane, you have a, a bit of a different model. I was wondering if you could kind of briefly talk about that. I do. So I am Diane Bizgeyer, and I am with Web Forward, which is the accelerator program run by Mozilla. So when I talk about our program, I basically say we are Mozilla Accelerator, of course. And so it's really important to understand what Mozilla is. And so if some of you went to the keynote yesterday with Mitchell Baker, who's our chair, she talked a bit about how Mozilla operates and what we care about. So Mozilla cares about the web as an open resource that's not owned by any proprietary entity, government, or commercial entity. So insofar as Mozilla makes products, 
and supports entrepreneurs that build products that keep the web open and make it accessible, those are the types of companies that we want to support in our programs. So unlike other accelerator programs whose primary focus is high growth, our primary focus is high innovation around open web standards. So once you self-select into that category as an entrepreneur, then you can look at our program. Um, so we, we really want to support companies that are building very innovative open standards web technologies and products. So that's one way that we are Mozilla and that we're different. Uh, another way is, just as Anne touched on, um, we believe that the web is universal and global and that people should not have to come to San Francisco outside of our orientation and our graduation day. <laughs> so um, we start the program and end the program in Silicon Valley because we think that there are many, many things to be learned from Silicon Valley and the people there. And exposure to investors and professionals and experts in Silicon Valley is extraordinarily beneficial to our teams. And at the same time, we want innovation to be supported and fostered wherever those people are. So for the duration of our program, they actually live in Romania, Greece, India, Italy, France, UK, wherever you live and wherever you're building your product, you stay there and we kick your butt. <laughs> so we have a three and a half month program where we actually put you through very interactive exercises so that you actually build your business. So it's not necessarily an issue of just throwing you into a room, it's an issue of you staying in your market, learning your market, serving your market, and applying the best practices in marketing and legal and sales and design to your specific innovation around the web. So that's how our program works. We're a free service for Mozilla, so we actually take no equity stake in you. You own your whole company as an entrepreneur. We offer this as a resource because we want the web to be good and we want the web to be evolving and changing and innovating. So, so this is something that we offer and obviously it goes without saying that you become a part of the Mozilla community when you become part of Web Forward. So if you work or live near a Mozilla space, you get connected to the people in that community. You get to know Mozilla engineers, you get help from Mozilla engineers as well as all the mentors that want to help Mozilla out like I said, in Silicon Valley, but everywhere around the world, so. I mean, it's quite an unusual sort of model in, in lots of ways, and I think uh, you really have to completely understand open source and, and the nature of Mozilla to really understand the sort of benefit, I think, of, of your system. It's, it's very easy to sort of see, you know, John and Carlos and, and Anne say, look, we give you loads of money and we give you this space, and then it almost sounds as though you don't give us anything, like, you know, what... You can't ah, get, but it, it that's isn't that, sad. Right? No, we give you everything. So, um, so first of all, um, we're extraordinarily complimentary to these types of programs. We've had teams that have done TechStars, Y Combinator, as well as our program. Um, we give you all the real value that you actually need to build a business. And if you happen to need money as part of that, we give you lots of coaching on pitching your business. We introduce you to investors. Um, and again, you own your business. We don't own your business. So we're very complimentary to other programs. Um, and we give you all the real value that you would hopefully expect out of an accelerator, which is very very hands-on coaching so that um, you can focus on the thing that you do best, which typically as a developer is writing really good code. And you probably don't know how to market, and that's okay. And that's why you join our accelerator. Awesome. Thank you. Sure. And on to Collider. So you know, how do you fit into this grand ecosystem of all of these people? We're quite uh, specific in terms of uh, the, the niche part, part of the market that we're looking at. So um, we, we do actually refer into the likes of Techstars and, uh, and Seacamp. Collider in the second year now, second round that we're coming into, um, is a B2Brand accelerator. So we're looking at technology that's going to help large brands achieve their marketing goals, their growth per se, and to engage their customer base in more with mobile and, and tech, um, tech applications. Um, so this is our second round, uh, building on the success, uh, what we believe, of the first one. Um, with the brands that we've got on this year, we've got the likes of um, Unilever, uh, BBC Worldwide, William Hill, Bauer Media, and CBS. So we've got a combination, really, of everything that the guys have talked about today in terms that we offer money, uh, we offer mentoring, and we offer market access. And they're, all those three are quite combined. So on the money part, we uh, put in a package of £100,000, uh, which is split equity and debt. 
Um, and obviously, be, some of that being debt, you retain that little bit more equity in the business at this early stage. Um, Mentoring-wise, you get a one-to-one -one coach and a series of mentors, a bit similar to, to the guys at Techstars and, and Seacamp. And then the market access part, I think, is one of the unique parts in terms of the brands are each putting a brand mentor in to one of the startups. So that really helps to shape the technology and hopefully will bring that to market quicker with the market insight and the customer insights that you'll be given. Uh, it's England-wide, um, and we've just um, opened up the second round this week. So, you know, John, what is it that, you know, I mean, I'll probably ask all of you this, this is a similar question, but what is it that you're particularly at Techstars, and, and, and obviously you have a long, long history of, of, of incubations and accelerators, what is it that you're looking to see? I mean, if, if, if these lovely, beautiful young faces here are trying to get into, into Techstars, what is it that they kind of need to do? Uh, be persistent. Um, Is that because you're bad at email? No, no. Actually, quite the opposite, I think. Um, be persistent because we get a huge number of applicants. Uh, we have an excess of a 1,000. Um, it's not unknown for teams to have to apply two or three times before they get in. Um, it's important that you hustle to try and find ways to me that if it comes through mentors or other referrals, that helps. Um, but essentially, it, it's really about the people. Um, uh, I basically talk about the fact that we have five criteria when we pick teams, and it includes um, team, 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 opportunity, and team. Um, what was that T word you used? Uh, team, I think. Um, but essentially, at such an early stage of an organization, that everything is essentially around the team. And the, the ability of the founders of any organization to have the flexibility and the persistence to kind of push through um, and the willingness to potentially change the product or business model is really, really important. Having a fixed kind of product coming in with an average team the chances of them getting through five, seven years later to something really successful is pretty slim. I mean, this stuff is really hard to do. Carlos, what do you think? Do you agree with that? Or is it, is it all about team? Is it actually about product? Or is it actually about sort of market opportunity? I mean, it's obviously a combination of the two. But let's, let's look at a little bit deeper to what, what John said regarding persistence. For one, I think any program um, that has several applicants is going to involve a level of competition to try to get in, right? And the persistence means that if you don't get in the first time, you'll get in the second or third. And we have several companies that have gone through that process. Now, to the second point, which was about team, um, you might be asking yourself, well, what, what is a team? Like, what, what is it that an accelerator looks for in a team? Um, one preconceived notion is that you need to have a technical founder. Now, it doesn't mean you, we don't necessarily say, no, you, you have to have one but it just helps. It helps when the money's running low to have somebody in your team code. However, we do have people that are sole founders and have some amazing propositions, and because of that, we know we can get the resources around them to do that. So that's just one myth that is maybe just a break on behalf of everyone. However, we do look for teams that stand out on their technical expertise. You know, we have guys that are uh, amazingly known in the open source world and have done many amazing projects. So as a team member, you know that these people are capable of innovation. Half the time, companies enter with one idea and six months later, they've changed it slightly. And at times, we've invested in companies where the guys, the idea was kind of not ideal, but we knew that they were going to work their way through it to the very end um, by removing things that weren't working adding new things or perhaps even scrapping and starting again. And so that's kind of what, what I mean by a quality team, is somebody who can assess when things are going poorly, rectify them, and have the capabilities internally to be able to do that. And being persistent enough to find the right people to get the connections to enter one of our programs. We had one applicant for, we, this is Seed Camp Week right now for us, and we had one applicant who pinged two different founders of our seed camp companies to get recommended to attend. And so like that kind of resourcefulness gets you very far because I take emails from my companies very seriously and so having two guys, two different sources says, hey, this guy's pretty cool, you should meet him. Well, guess what, I did.
did he get in? Yeah, he's, he's in right now. So that, that just want to make sure that did actually happen. It wasn't just, yeah. you know. No, no, he's, he's, he's pitching right now. Awesome, awesome. And Anne, so, you know, you agree with this? Sort of all team, if I come with my sort of, I don't know, social network for cats, but you like me, and I can't prove any revenue, but you like me, are you going to invest in me? Are you going gonna, gonna to help me out? No, I'm a dog person. Um, but this whole notion of the, the, the quality of the team, we've talked about it all week, guys. The quality of the team is absolutely paramount. But here's another thing on that. You have to be able to take feedback. If you want to be in an accelerator, you have to be able to take the constructive criticism, take it on board, not take it personally, or if you are taking it personally, kind of have the veneer on your face that goes, thank you for that. Oh my god, that hurts. And then afterwards, go and change. If you're not that kind of person, particularly in Wire, you're not going to enjoy it. You're not going to enjoy it. You're therefore not going to change. You're not going to embrace that kind of feedback. You're not going to move forward. We've met lots and lots of co-founders and startups who have got extraordinary ideas. They're an extraordinary team. Together, they, they clearly look like they're going to move mountains. The problem is we think and all of our advisors are also agreeing with us, saying they're moving, moving the wrong mountain. But they don't care. Whatever feedback we give them, they carry on moving the wrong mountain, and they're not listening. The ability to listen and the ability to take the feedback is hugely important. So being true to yourself, being true to your idea is absolutely critical. But that balance between being belligerent and a bit stupid-minded to not kind of realize that everybody is telling you this, this isn't going to work. You know what? You kind of need to be able to take that feedback, take it on the chin, and then do something with it. I didn't listen to a word of that, but I'm sure it was interesting. <laughs> Diane, I'm wondering if you can sort of talk. I mean, obviously, these guys can do the face-to-face, -face, right? They can actually get up in someone's grill and say, look, shitty product, shitty idea, you don't know what you're doing, you know, learn to code, stop doing this. How do you do that over, you know, is it just an angry email? Is it... <laughs> That's happened, but <laughs> it's not by uh, design. Um, so as I mentioned, we actually convene all the teams at the beginning of the program. So we actually have a focused time where the teams not only get to know each other, but they get to meet their mentors and they get to meet other people from Mozilla. So when you spend three focused days together, you actually get to know each other quite well. And then we also have a very, very structured three month program. So rather than just hoping that serendipity happens because you're in the same cube, we actually engineer meetings with you and your mentors you and the other team members. So we have calls where we're actually giving very focused feedback on their marketing, on their design, on their pitching. So that's kind of how the, the feedback works. Um, in terms of what's a good fit for our program, to the original question, I would say obviously receptive to feedback, solid team, no question, right? Being resourceful, that's sort of like ticket to play. Um, for us, it's super important to be innovative. So you've got to be doing something new to the web. So yeah, cat network, I don't care how motivated you are, a cat network is just not part of Mozilla's vision. So, um, so really the product and the degree of innovation that it's presenting around the web is critical to what our teams are doing. That doesn't mean that they won't change the product according to market feedback. That's just how startups work. But they need to have the chops to actually build something. So most of our founders tend to be technical. Um, they tend to be very deep um, in terms of web development. So that's why our program is a good fit for them because we round out those skills with the business tools that they need to actually build a successful business. So I would say technical chops, innovation, and, um, and um, I was going to say something else. But um, oh, commitment to build a business, basically. So you do oftentimes get very skilled technical innovators who don't necessarily want to be a business person. But we want business people, or people who aspire to be business people, <laughs> I should say. Interesting. And now, so it mean, sounds you know, quite, quite technically focused, really, uh, in, in lots of ways. And then sort of the other three sort of a bit more sort of people orientated, perhaps. You know, this brand piece that you have here, I mean, you know, yeah. are you going to you know, take my cat network and sell it to BMW? Well, I don't think so. I don't know if they're interested it's in very that. very good so cat cats, network. Yeah, 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 exactly. Um, yeah, I mean, I think given the early nature of what Collider looks to do and the brands that we've got on board, that 
echoing what the guys have said here, the flexibility in the management team, I think. So the talk this morning for the people that were here was about challenges and pivots in the technology, and it may go down different streams. And that's the sort of flexibility that we're going to be looking at in our management teams, because I mean, there is an example in our first portfolio. William Hill have taken a piece of uh, in-game advertising that, 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 that they don't like. And, but they needed to change the direction of the team. We just wanted two technical parts and whatever in the direction. And that's been done, the team has been receptive to that. So um, echoing what Anne was saying as well, I think it's just emerging yourself in the accelerator that you join. Uh, I mean, network, 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 and, and get yourself fully involved. That's when you're going to get the most out of it. Just extending your network and, you, you know, will reap new contacts and possible dividends. Interesting. Now, um, we're going to have a bit of a contentious discussion actually up, which Carlos sort of brought up at the beginning, which is we were chatting, which is, you know, are there too many accelerators? Are there just, there seems to be a lot. Like every week there seems to be someone doing something. There seems to be a new vertical that, you know, there seems to be an accelerator for cat networks coming out almost every single week. You know, are there, are there too many? John, what do you think? I mean, you've, you've been in the game for a long time. Uh, no. So I think there's now currently in excess of um, a thousand accelerators on the planet. Um, I take the view, which is I've never heard anybody say, you know what, we've got too many angel investors. Or we've got too many VCs. So why def would we have too many accelerators? Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that all of them will survive. No different from an angel will invest and some of them will withdraw and go away. Some of them may not be uh, commercially minded. We are extremely focused on making a return for our investors. Um, and, and I think what will end up happening is no different from the way uh, angels and VC market evolves, is you will have top tier and they will kind of sail off into the distance because there's a self-fulfilling prophecy, which is if you do really, if you're really good at what you do, you can attract really strong teams. Kind of to put that into context, we have 11 teams in the program at the minute. Eight of those teams have seed funding before they get to my program. Yeah, I have eight teams that are going into demo day that don't need to raise money. Yeah, that's the quality of the teams that we're getting. And so therefore, people get attracted to, toward that. We get later stage teams, yeah. If you don't do a good job, what ends up happening is you don't attract so good teams and the whole thing starts to fall apart. But that doesn't necessarily mean that there's too many. You have to test the market, it's a market opportunity. Some people will try different models and people have different motivations around all of these things. I mean, Carlos, how do we how do we sniff out the good from the bad? I mean, obviously, I'm saying to these people that, that you guys are all great and, and that we think you're wonderful, but you know, if you know, I don't know, we have people from all across the world here. How do they kind of almost due deal and, and sort of inspect these people who are coming to help and, and trying to be useful and they want to take a bit of the company, give you a little bit of money in a desk space? How can we, how can we as entrepreneurs ensure that we're protected? Cue epic music. <laughs> yeah, it's just for you. Seriously, wow. <laughs> Inspired talk now. That's when I had the tiger comes on. Seriously, wow. Um, so if you look at the way that most venture capital funds have differentiated over the last few years, you've had the top, the top funds have continually surprised all their investors with just ongoing returns of success. Um, and therefore, that's why they continue to be the top funds. Then you have new funds which are specializing. So you might have like a pharmaceutical fund, you might have a clean tech fund, you might have all these things. And I think the same thing is eventually going to happen with, with the, the space that we're in, which is we'll have perhaps the, the original programs continue to exist as a generalist program that provide access to a lot of the things that uh, most companies need and all the right connections. And then you have other programs which are going to be very, very specific to being the, the leader for a pharmaceutical startup. And that will provide a very different set of of things, you know, like with pharmaceuticals, you might have a, a period that drugs need to be tested. It's a very different type of structure, which is going to be specialized for that kind of startup. So that's kind of how I see the space evolving. And therefore, that will allow the universe for accelerators to expand, but it'll have to be clustered around either 
the tiering that John mentioned or verticalization of them. Interesting. Okay. So, I mean, Anne, I mean, you know, we can, you know, I, I talked earlier this week and this morning about my dislike for, for large corporations. Um, Telefonica is quite a large corporation. Yeah, a little bit. Uh, how do I know if I kind of come into either uh, you know, your, your, your accelerator or another sort of big brand accelerators, of which there are now many, mm -hmm. how do I know that what you're not doing is basically being really lazy as a large corporation and just basically trying to take my idea. And what you're investing in isn't maybe investable. It's actually just suits Telefonica's needs. They actually really want a cat network that I'm building. <laughs> and how do I know I'm not just working for no money, um, not getting paid, and actually uh, an employee for for big, gigantic corporation? Okay, so seriously, the cat network thing is not, it's not going to happen, mate. You just don't understand. Steve Jobs <laughs> loves it. I bet he does. So... The way that Telefonica has organized Wire It, we're a completely separate legal entity. What that gives us is enough distance away from the corporate machine in order for us to be swift, to make decisions, to make those investments quickly, but close enough that we can still take advantage of all of the other things that Telefonica can give you, which is brilliant. Things like advice on legal structure, advice on marketing campaigns, advice, stuff that we do every day because we're a big company and that's what we do. It's our bread and butter. I think ultimately as well, though, because we're only taking such a small percentage of equity of your, your, your business, we don't take a seat on your board. We don't tell you what to do. In fact, we'd prefer it if you make all of those decisions without us because what we're not trying to do is spoon feed you. We're not trying to turn you into the next Telefonica. As I mentioned earlier, you know, the, the recognition from Telefonica that it's a massive monolithic kind of corporation, that if we carry on doing exactly what we're doing today, we will not be here in a year, 10 years, some, whoever knows what the, the, the glide path is. But we recognize that as a, a traditional monolithic telco, the future is not us. The future is you guys. So we need to find a way to be part of that from a grass grassroots level and also help you be successful because that then gives us the credibility to then, when you are brilliant and successful, that you'll want to work with us. Interesting. The question from the front. Lovely. Sir. Um, if a person is successful in securing funds from any one of you, does that improve their prospects of getting funds from other um, other accelerators? In other words, does, does the success of the one accelerator count as a recommendation to the others? And secondly, if one has secured funds successfully with, with, with an accelerator, does that mean, do they sort of go to the back of the queue for, in other words, would you give a, a better chance to another company, uh, to, to another company to have funds? If I, if I apply to, to all of you, um, I, if, if the, fa the fact that I've secured funds with a, gr a group of you, w would that um, sort of put me further back in the queue and would you sort of give more priority to somebody who has no funds? Maybe, you go, you start, Maybe this is a, uh, your question is, is I, I understand the ethos of it, but what's funny is that the, the goal of an accelerator is not to get you into another accelerator. The goal of an accelerator is to get you out. Yeah. So if, if, you know, if a company does that, repeatedly, they are a, what would you call it, a chronic abuser of accelerator <laughs> <laughs> utility. I, I mean, it's, it's not the objective. However, your, your question, I think the, 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 the spirit of it is, how much do we cumulatively help fundraise? Um, and that is kind of a large part of what we do. Um, we published some numbers earlier this week, and um, if you look at every one of our yearly classes, they each exceed 80% in in fundraising. Um, and so you're basically looking at a high probability of getting secured follow-on funding by going through our program. And each one of us has, in, in, this, in this panel has specialized their program around providing that level of support. I think the other thing I would say as well is that a lot of the VCs, they have, I mean, if we get thousands of applications, they probably get 10,000 proposals sitting on their desk. They're not idiots. They're going to look at who's done the pre-filtering for me so that I can kind of just get a little bit of a head start. So if they've been through Techstars or Seedcamp or Mozilla or Collidio, they're going to go, 
actually, that means that there's something in there. I should probably have a look at it. So it's not going to preclude that you're going to get further stage investment from a VC, but it will help. It will certainly get your application to the top of the pile, I would have thought. I, I also think you're asking the wrong question because you're describing securing funding for us. For, from where we sit, the funding is the most irrelevant part of the process. That is the fundamental part of an accelerator. It's about the support and the advice that you get through the program. The money is there to just to keep you alive, yeah? You, For as long and enough that you can actually take the advice and the support and the resources that are available to kind of take your business to a whole different place. Yeah, that was, um, if we were gonna get to me, I was gonna, you know, I don't know if we were gonna round out the whole thing on the question, but the, I have the original- no idea yeah, what yeah, I'm yeah, doing. No, so, no idea. So, so the question was sort of where where accelerators were going. I think that was kind of what teed off this thread. Um, and and I did see find it interesting that you talked about sort of the, um, the generalists and the specialists, and then you compared it to venture funds, and that was your comparison point. And, and I would say, I totally agree with absolutely everything that's been said, including the, that money is just sort of secondary. When you're talking about accelerators, um, it's, it's the coaching and the mentorship and the expertise is increasingly important because accelerators work with very early stage companies. So um, the commoditization happens as companies mature. As you mature, you can do your own thing. You've got a management team, you've got sales, you've got a business model that's, and then it's literally the transactional money that becomes more important. But in the early stages, I couldn't agree more. It's the coaching and the hands-on help that you get from an accelerator. So the comparison boy that I would pick in terms of the trend of accelerators is less VC funds and more schools. Because I look at accelerators as startup school. You, you've got to roll up your sleeves and do the work to build a company, and that is school. So in terms of the future of accelerators, I would say that um, specialized, differentiated ones definitely have a place, because if you love music, you're probably gonna go to um, Berkeley School of Music in Boston, or <laughs> Juilliard, or something like that. So I think that there's a sustainable model for accelerators that have a specific focus, um, and the alumni network will play into those, and it'll reinforce the strengths of those. The generalist ones, um, Maybe there will be a few top schools, like a Harvard and a Stanford, but as we're seeing in education today, if you're a generalist school, it's getting really hard to keep going if you're not a Harvard or a Stanford. So that's the comparison point I would make to draw off of all the points that were just made. So. I think that's very interesting. I think um, ben, one of the Can I just ask one question to the, to the Please. Group? How, many, how many of you think the word incubator equals accelerator? Okay. I just want to make that distinction. Can we just, sorry, a round of applause for being honest. Thank you. <laughs> I, I just want to make sure that distinction is clear because pretty much here everyone is an accelerator and not an incubator. And those terms sometimes are used interchangeably. There was, I had a question asked of me the other, the other day about why the incubator bubble that happened and why this was going to happen all over again. And the question was, you know, it's a valid one, but the, the distinction is important between accelerator and, and incubator. An incubator is place where you potentially just have real estate and a bunch of people working together so that you get some support there for being co-working. The problem that happened is that you get, you get chummy with the people that you're there and you basically become complacent on growing outside of that. Whereas the role of an accelerator is not to provide you a chummy place for you to relax and just become sedentary in that context, but rather the accelerators are about getting you to grow to the point where you move out. And so the distinction between accelerator is what we've been talking about this entire time, which is mentoring to accelerate growth, which means eventually you will outgrow the space that you're in and you will grow into a new one. And that's what everyone here does, just to make that distinction clear. It's a, it's a, it's a worthwhile point. Do you think it is possible that you know, if you ever encountered a team uh, who effectively don't, not, don't want to be accelerated, but are kind of thinking it's more like a little bit of money, a bit of desk space, and I can probably ignore the rest. <laughs> Has that ever happened to anyone? Oh, yeah. Yeah? <laughs> so, obviously, I'm not going to name names. Um, you should. Maybe you should. I should, I know, but I'm not going to. Look, the, the one particular team, my, my observation when they came in, they had such potential to colossally grow very, very quickly. They were already pr um, post-revenue. They had customers. They had their product completely nailed. 
The problem that they had, though, was that the CEO would not let go. They would not let go of the decisions of the hiring and the firing of the, 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 the sort of the sales process. Literally every part of the startup, the start, this particular CEO would not let go of. Now, if I'm being brutally honest about whether or not Wira helped accelerate that business, I would say, no, we didn't. Now, was that because we, wouldn't, we weren't giving the right advice, the right advisors, the right coaching? I'd argue we did. I'd argue that person did not want to hear it. And equally, they didn't actually want acceleration. They just wanted the Telefonica brand name to help them. Yeah, they, they, wanted, they wanted the kind of the, the, the affiliation is a great word. They wanted the affiliation with the brand in order that they could actually talk about it in their marketing material. But they actually didn't accelerate one bit. I mean, you talked to me, you said a lot about team and, you know, the, the people and, and, you know, how can one, as either an entrepreneur or as an investor, or any, how can one sort of get better, I guess, at either taking this feedback on or, you know, I know lots of times that uh, you know, had, I've had business ideas that have been shot publicly in the street and then kicked to death. And then I've had to drag the sad, sorry carcass of my business all the way back to my parents while they then urinated on it. And then I cry. <laughs> and it hurts, right? It really hurts and it feels bad. How can one sort of, you know, is there any sort of training you do to help people get nicer, better, stronger, more resilient? John, maybe we'll start with you. Um, so um, our, our teams during the first three or four weeks will probably meet upward of 100 different people. And actually that becomes a little bit easier because what you learn is, I think somebody alluded to this earlier, which was um, uh, mentor's opinion is just that, it's their opinion and it's data. And one of the things we tend to say to teams is start to look at the trends in the data. And actually for young teams, it's a really good way of helping them to prioritize um, what they should and shouldn't be doing. So it's, it's an opinion and it's just a data point. What the key is, is to find as many smart data points as you practically can on one side. The other thing that is really important to remember is those guys are gonna sit t t initially, probably for you with 20, 20 minutes, half an hour. Um, some of those will engage with you and work with you on a much longer term basis. But they've only known about your business for 20 minutes, yeah? The only people that care about your business when you get up in the morning is the founder. And the only person that cares about your business when you go to bed at night is the founder. And, and you just have to learn that these people are just data points. I think that's a, 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 a really crucial and, and key point, actually, is uh, people's opinions are just data points. And they yeah. can sometimes be very, very painful data, yeah. but they are just one of many. And actually, uh, I think the strength of people who seem to succeed is they kind of walk through that noise quite successfully. They kind of manage to yeah. agree or disagree. When it comes to brands and big sort of brands, obviously the brands are looking to almost, yeah. they're almost going shopping, aren't they? Kind of a little bit, right? Yeah. And so, yeah, again, yeah. You know, these data points become a bit fuzzier, don't they? They can do, they can do. I mean, what we've done in, in our particular phase is a series of the collisions early on. So um, I think it was mentioned uh, in the talk again this morning for people that are here in terms that we've got the brands in very early on. So on startups, so very early stage companies, then four, eight, four weeks in, eight weeks in, 12 weeks in. So the brands can see the developments there and to see if the teams are taking on the points of recommendation and feedback. So then the brands will probably midway through the point start working really in depth with two or three of the teams. And so That's how do the, how do the, I mean, do, do the brands effectively take startups on as clients? Do the startups take the brand on as clients? How does this kind of work? No, it's all commercial arrangements. We're looking commercial arrangements at the end of the day. So our passion is the UK startup. So that's what we're looking to push. So it would be full commercial agreements. Okay, so and and they, are there any NDAs or is that sort of stuff? Or no, 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 just no, straight in, yeah. Okay, so you all, so all you're kind of trying to do is, is basically introduce startups to potential clients. It is, yeah. And, and, and on the other side... The, the take their feedback on board, yeah. Yeah, so the, the clients can take their feedback on board. The brands can then obviously start to go out and interact hopefully with their customers more effectively. Very interesting. I'm sure there's a ton of questions, and if there's not, then you haven't been paying attention. Excellent. You've been asking a lot of questions this week. Well done. I try to. I try to. Hi, everyone. I'm Linda, um, founder at See My Events. Um, so basically, my question goes to everyone on the panel, starting with John. Um, so firstly, I mean, 
what has been really your most memorable and successful candidate um, to date? And by measure of successful, that can be financial or the improvements that the team has made. What, what has it been? Um, so you can pick one to date. Just one. Um, the, probably the most successful business that sits inside Techstars today is something called SendGrid, which is possibly the most boring business in the world, <laughs> but makes a shit ton of money. Uh, and we'll probably IPO for an excess of a billion dollars in the next 18 months. I might also ask you, the most interesting but perhaps sort of notable failure, maybe you actually, in, in all of you, like, if, you know, what was the kind of the idea? You were like, I love that, and then it just kind of didn't do it. Yeah, I, it's funny. Your question is the company I'm thinking of fits both questions at the same time because it started off Quantum in, company. in 2007, as a f uh, 2008 as a failure. And it's because it was a collaborative consumption play. It was called Rent Mine Online. And um, it was before its time. As we know, like right now, Airbnb and all that kind of legitimized collaborative consumption. But before, it was people, well, I'm not going to loan them anything mine. As the name implied from the company, Rent Mine Online, it was beyond. It was before its time. So the founder, uh, Ed Spiegel, basically had to move in, like laid off everybody, moved in with his parents after about a year and a half of operations, like hit the lowest, lowest of points. Now, he was a VC at DFJ of Spree um, before quitting to start this company. So he was like, I'm a VC, I should be able to figure this out. So he's here, launches an amazing idea before its time, fails miserably, moves in with his parents, still keeping it going, does a pivot moving into referrals for a, a flat, right? So rent mine being flats. So pivots into that right at the right time when the collaborative consumption play starts coming out and we sold it uh, last year to a publicly traded company. So it is just one of those stories where you see it go from here and you know the definition of entrepreneur is somebody who gets told no and still keeps on going and this is kind of what happened with him. It's like he's, no, things got bad and then he made it out. Now he's one of our alumni mentors, comes and shares his story because it is both the questions is both one of our proudest moments and also one of probably the ones that we're like, well, it's too bad, you know, but it turned out okay. I just had the, the vision, knowing quite a few VCs, the vision of a VC going back home. I kind of like that. I can imagine that would, that really must have hurt. So, <laughs> and come on, what about you? You must have had a, you must have had a seen a fair few stories, some I tragic have. tales. That's what we want. Oh, uh, the, the genuinely the idea of picking one. I hate you for that question. You're That's just being horrible. nice, Anne. Just pick so one. You have I am one. Of I'm, pick you do. I'm picking one. I'm picking one. They're called Ted Cass. They're from Madrid. They're amazing. It's an amazing team. And Toby, just, you know, suck it up for a few seconds. Right. Ted Cass have designed a software, slightly bit of hardware solution that allows surgeons to be able to move a screen around. If you remember Minority Report, so the, the idea to be able to move a, a screen around with a hand gesture, uh, probably a little bit more lucidly than that, but Lots yes. camp as well. Um, absolutely. And, and do you know what? One of the reasons why I love these guys, number one, they embody the wireless spirit, which is they will never give up. These guys ha always have a smile on their face as well. And, and that ability to just light the room up, they have it in spades. Number two, the tech's just cool. I mean, when you see it in action, you just go, oh, that's just cool, man. I want some of that. I want it. You want to take it home with you. Number three, it's cool as well because it's built on Microsoft Connect. It's an application of existing technology in a space that hadn't actually been disrupted at the time. And then the very last reason why I love them, the product worked. They got it designed. They had it built. It was working. What they didn't have was the ability to walk into Microsoft and say, please, can we use your software so that we can actually sell it to loads of different people? That's where Wira helped. You know, we, with our Telefonica creds, um, Jose Maria picked up the phone and spoke to the guys at Microsoft. And the next day, they had the meeting. The door was opened. A few weeks later, their software was licensed pretty much um, all across Europe, South Africa, and the Far East. You know, that, for me, is the beauty of being able to use the corporate brand to do something good. So Diane, I think I'm going to let you go straight to you because, obviously, you know, the great big blue of, of, of Redmond, Microsoft there, sort of demonstrating exactly how being closed can sometimes prevent 
innovation. I mean, what have you seen that's been really interesting in the open space? And I guess it probably has a slight difference because obviously open can branch in multiple ways. But have you seen anything from through your accelerator that started one thing and maybe branched into another? Oh, that's a different question. You're changing the question up I as am. you go I'm along. Tricky like that. You I had an attention. answer already, and mm. now you want me to do something different. Well, you can pick okay. one. Go on, okay, pick one. Good. Pick your favorite. I want to pick. <laughs> if that's going to be easier for you, sorry, <laughs> just pick one. Um, well, I will pick a, an example that illustrates what we're about. I think that's the tack that you took, Anne, and I like that. So um, we don't play favorites, but um, but yeah, it plays into the UK. So we have an alumni team called Symbiota, and um, they were studying. Uh, molecular biology and synthetic biology at Cambridge. Um, super bright people, they went to something called Singularity University in the States, so very future forward thinking people that embrace technology as well as biology. So they had a vision to um, fundamentally change how researchers collaborated because the way that synthetic biologists today get stuff done, like make genes and make synthetic modules and DNA uh, sequences is through Microsoft Word, <laughs> um, which is not a very collaborative platform and not a very efficient or effective platform like the web is. So they had a vision to use the web so that collaboration would exponentially increase and as a result, lives would be changed. So um, they were in our program about two years ago, actually. So um, they're one of our first teams. And they represent to me, one, the promise of the web to change lives, the promise of people in other disciplines to embrace the web and use the web to innovate. And um, I'm really happy to report that they actually have raised about a million um, pounds. So they're getting traction. They have customers in Canada that are adopting their technologies. Um, so they're actually having an impact. They're becoming sustainable. And they're embracing the web um, in ways that really impacts lives. So, um, so for lots of reasons, I will talk about them here. That does sound pretty awesome, I have to say, actually. Um, <laughs> and the same question, obviously. Yeah, thank you. You, you don't say you don't do favourites. Everyone does. That's life. Well, we're different, but we're only nine months old. So, I, and I've only got nine companies to choose from. So, but babies get born in nine months. Come yeah, on. they do. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, I think success-wise, um, probably my appy, uh, bringing um, all the social media feeds into one place. So, and they've got um, two or three live commercial agreements that they're going for at the moment, and they've raised about a bunch of seed money. So that's good, so they've got follow-on cash there. Um, and then you did ask about, in, in terms of unsuccessful, I mean, obviously very early stages still, but I mean, there's one company that maybe, as we were talking about earlier in the team, they've gone into their silo a little bit, um, and they've gone a bit introvert, and, and they haven't networked and really fully engaged as yet on the accelerator, so we've got a bit of work to do with that one. And again, just goes back to earlier points, you know, to really engage and, and, and get involved in the accelerator, that's what they're there for. Nancy, that reminds me of an interesting question that came up this morning, which is, you know, well, you know, I've got this fantastic uh, cat network, um, <laughs> which is which is a superb piece of kit, and I want to get accelerated. And I know the textiles will invest in it because I know that John likes cats, and he he's a big big sort of social social media fiend, and wants to be able to share pictures of his cat with other cats. Um, what if I don't want to physically be in textiles? What if I don't like other people? What if I only like cats, and I don't I don't want to be in your space, but I do want your money? and I don't really want to work out of your space. Is that possible? Uh, so a couple of points I'd like to make. One is actually um, there was a network in Estonia for uh, cats and dogs. It's already been tried, didn't work. Um, Mine is pretty good. Yeah. Um, so what I would do is I would suggest you would look at one of the corporate programs we run. Um, so we also run white label programs for large corporates such as Nike. So if your gig is self-quantification, um, what we can do is um, we can work, uh, we bring in all of our mentors um, on our side, and uh, half of the mentors come in from the corporate itself, and we get real in-depth expertise in a specific area. So for example, with uh, Connect, uh, we actually ran the Connect Accelerator uh, in Seattle where we had 10 teams doing all the same thing. So you can imagine the amount of value you can add and the, the, the sharing of information between those points. We work with Kaplan in education and do exactly the same thing. And with Nike, we've done exactly the same thing as well. So we can bring a different dynamic. And we have seen teams who have opted out of not doing tech stars because they've gone, that's interesting, but 
actually we want to go and work in Kaplan because the in-depth expertise, knowledge um, is really, really valuable when you kind of put those two things together. Carlos, I mean, uh, just thinking, you know, if I were to go through the, the, the process of, of pitching to CCAP and getting into CCAP and you said, yes, Ben, your cat network is superb. It's not like the shitty Estonian one before. That was rubbish. Yours is really good. And then I decided I don't want, I don't want to go through with CCAP. Could I still effectively use the fact that you said yes to me as a rubber stamp to other investors? Would you still help me even if I turned you personally down? Not you personally, but your, your program. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's tough because this is a, this is a, um, a relationship business. Like, you cannot show up and expect, you know, like, there's going to be companies that are killing themselves, working out on stuff. And the enthusiasm that I'm going to have to try to get them uh, to the right people is very different than somebody who's basically saying, I don't want to work with you. I don't want to do anything with you. By the way, the whole purpose of the selection program that we all have is to make sure that we don't find any of those companies. So therefore I can happily say, I don't think we really have any that are in that situation. And you know, occasionally something like that might happen, but you really work on changing that and you try to figure out why. But if that were the case, fictionally speaking, like, well, could, you, could that team also expect that they're gonna get, you know, like not, they're, they're just gonna get the same treatment? They're, they're not, I mean, it's just unrealistic. So, and investors ask questions. They're not gonna be like, so, Carlos, are these guys hard work? What am I supposed to say, right? So it, it is very much a relationship business. It's about being transparent and saying, look, this is how these guys are. And that's why we choose to back the best companies. That's a, a great answer, because it's a bit of a shitty, silly question, really, I thought. Um, what, what are we seeing, Diane? What are, we, what are you seeing in trends? Anything exciting? Is it is it still social geo, local sharing apps for cat pictures? Is it something more exciting? Um, well, for our focus, again, we're really focused on what's next, so um, no. <laughs> um, but I would say um, there's a lot of interesting things around devices and that connectivity between the web and devices, so Internet of Things. So we had a company in Greece in our last cohort that has a web-based um, integrated development environment so that you can actually work with Raspberry Pi and Arduino and programmable devices, but it's all web-based technologies, so you don't have to buy into one proprietary stack. So um, that's super interesting for us. The 3D printing space is obviously a massive opportunity across the board, not just for the web, but um, we had a team in Paris called Sketchfab that um, is another web-based platform, so you don't have to buy a proprietary download or plug-in or anything like that. You actually can use the web to create and model 3D models, and so they're working with a number of 3D manufacturers to partner um, and take, a, take advantage of that huge opportunity in manufacturing. I mean, that's interesting. I mean, Mozilla have always been you know, very, very cutting edge and a huge advocate for, for, for the open web, and, uh, and I'm a big fan of theirs. You know, what about brands? I mean, you know, how does yeah. this work? How does this play out? Like, I, I've got a 3D printing, Internet of Things, social geolocation app that yeah. shares pictures of my cats and prints them off. Can, can I sell it to William Hill? Uh, don't know. Uh, without thinking, uh, I'll skip that. Um, <laughs> I think in terms of brands, um, you, you know, as you were saying earlier, in terms of how large they are and how slow moving some of them are. So, you know, we're taking new tech to them, which they're excited about. Current trends, you know, around gamification, a bit of big data as well. You know, being able to track customers is quite important for them, uh, and then how they w want to interact with their customers. So, we actually get a lead from the brands now. You, you know, how 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 do you want to interact? What are you looking at doing? Find some technology fits, or we actually put them back to the uh, to the brands and say, "Listen, we've got this technology. It can do X, Y, and Z. Let's trial it with a William Hill." Yeah, Maybe the, uh, cats. the the 3D printing cat social network that I have is really smart. I'd like that. One more question for you, and then we'll open it up and have more questions. I think it's a question for the Collider program. Um, do you tend to select your applicants based upon their? You may have sort of answered it partly. Alignment with the brands that you that are already parts of your relationship. Yeah. For instance, if somebody's looking for a, uh, to develop a product for yeah. a, rela a relationship with mobile companies, and, okay. none, and you don't have mobile companies as part of your uh, portfolio, if, you, if that's what you call it, yeah. uh, do, do, do they stand less of a chance to, to, sc I think to secure funding from you? I think it's a bit of both, actually. Uh, I mean, I think you guys, in terms of your startups, can do your research as well about the accelerators, and yeah, 
what brands that we've got on board. So if it's going to be straight away, you, you know, the William Hills, the CBS Outdoors, Unilevers of the world, that then great. And you know, we look on that quite favourably. You've done your research. You've come to us with a proposal. But no, we had a number of applications that were just quite generic, maybe looking for that space, didn't know about CBS Outdoor, maybe their activities. So then we can start to align. So no, but we would take quite an open view on the actual tech itself. Awesome. Do we have other questions? One, one, come on, two, two okay, there's at least a start. Hey guys, um, do you accept any responsibility for trying to inspire um, people to become entrepreneurs and go through the incubation stage and then come to you guys, or are you too far away from that initial stage? So I, I, I'll answer it because we have a program that it just does that, it's called uh, Seed Hack, and um, in a way we've taken the concept of a hackathon um, which is obviously just an aggregation of people working on a specific idea. And we said, okay, part of the problem comes from people having the ability but not having a good idea or rather an understanding of what industry problems there are. So the idea, the ethos behind SeedHack and how it's different than other hackathons is that we go, we research um, company problems. We research an industry's problems and we bring in speakers from that industry who identify key problems. So we've, do, we've done healthcare, we've done fashion, we've done uh, big data and fintech. And so each one of those industries, we've brought in people who say, look, these are the problems, go work on them. And so we've, we've spawned businesses, some of which have gone through Seed Camp, uh, from those events as a way of saying, look, you might not have an idea, so here's a, a way for you to work on it, we'll give you the resources to work on it, and then if it, if it surfaces to the top, we'll also include you in the next phase, which is Seed Camp. We, we um, approach this in a different way as well. Um, so we have internally um, what we call hack stars and associates during the program. Uh, because it's so hard to get into the program itself, um, what we do is open a channel up that you can actually come and work alongside the teams themselves. Um, what's happening at this point during the program is a number of those people are joining some of those startups on one side. Um, and something a, a little bit astonishing happened about 24 hours ago, which is one of the team, one of the series of the hack stars and the uh, associates actually partway through the program have created their own business. Um, they applied to not one of these accelerators, but one of the other London accelerators and actually have got accepted into one of those programs because they've effectively sat in on all of our lectures and all of the mentoring and they've been kind of taking up all of this information and actually applying it to the business that they've been doing themselves. And I think that's really important and I think all of us, without wanting to speak for every single one of us on the panel, but I think we would probably all share the same ethos, which is the reason why we're here. Yeah, all right, there's a commercial output that we're all trying to aim for, and we all, all want to make sure we get great exits and, and, and that kind of thing to be able to report back to the shareholders or report back to our, our bosses. That's not really why we're doing it. The reason why we're doing it is that we all genuinely believe that investing time, effort, and people into inspiring people to want to build their own businesses and to build businesses within digital startups is a good thing. So, you know, Telefonica's answer to how are we building the ecosystem, you sat in it. You know, Campus Party is massively sponsored and, and funded by Telefonica, been going for 10 years sponsored by Telefonica, 15 years in total. Every single year we hold this as a week-long hackathon in a major city. Last year it was in Berlin, this year London, next year who knows where it's going to go. Happens in Latin America as well. Our genuine desire is to inspire young people to consider digital skills as being a fundamental part of their future. If they then decide to then want to build their own startup, then great. They've got an outlet to potentially come to Wire, go to Seed Camp, to Techstars. Brilliant. But equally, we genuinely just want kids to learn how to code, to learn the digital economy, because that's our future. Yeah, I was basically going to say that we are a part of Mozilla, and we actually don't have shareholders to report back to, except for our board that oversees us. So we don't even have that. So we're wholly committed to the well-being of innovation, and that's why we're doing our program. And that's why we do other initiatives with Telefonica. So if you went to Building 6, you would see a whole zone dedicated to making the web, and it's doing exactly what Anne described. So we have a number of partners, including Telefonica, that are providing programs to kids and other people 
people around entrepreneurship, around digital literacy, and around coding skills. So, um, so Mozilla as a whole is extremely committed to that, and then our program is part of that value chain in terms of if they're ready to build a business on that, then we're offering web forward to them. So. Yeah. Yeah. We don't have anything here in London. Um, we don't have anything per se ourselves, but we'll plug into the guys at Techstars and Seacamp, and then London specific. So apologies to, to people outside London, but you know the meetup groups, UCL have got some enterprise schools and what have you as well. So they're good grounding places to then be able to then start considering and applying for accelerators. Hi guys, uh, just wanted to know how you were dealing with dilution in, uh, with your investments. Uh, so if you particularly like one of your startups, do you follow up in uh, next rounds? Or do you structure a special deal uh, for the, the origin to, uh, to prevent too much dilution, I guess? So what do you do I mean, regarding dilution? So we, we take finder stock exactly the same as the finders. So if the finders dilute, we dilute. And we align ourselves directly with that. And so as a result of that, we're on the founder's side at any point in time during any round. And so it's our motivation to ensure that they get the right amount of money at the right valuation. But having said that, um, without giving away too many stats, we are making a very strong return for our investors, even in a dilutive effect. So we don't necessarily perceive that to be a problem. So I'll say that Similar, similar to Techstars, we, um, we take ordinary shares um, in our companies. And when a company needs more capital later, we can also follow on. So we, we can provide capital throughout the life cycle of the company. Any of the others, you're more than welcome to add or you will happy with that? It's all the same? same. Right. Uh, excellent question, always good. <laughs> Do we have any more questions? No, you're all completely happy. No more questions. I have like 50 minutes to kill on this stage, please. Thank you. Thank God. <laughs> so uh, digital accelerators are really common. How about things like pharmaceuticals and biotechnology, medical devices? Uh, will we ever see accelerators in this sort of space? I, I think you will. But I think it'll end up having to be something that is backed by the pharmaceutical companies themselves as a way of helping them manage and navigate the approvals process and have the capital to weather that storm, right? Um, I don't know. I mean, you could argue that the revolution we're seeing with the commoditization of hardware that has enabled hardware accelerators to kind of take uh, some level of hold now might eventually happen. Like, if we were in the process in the next six years, eight years of having commoditized uh, DNA s sequencing or anything like that that allows you to have faster building, perhaps you'd start seeing a, mo a more sort of uh, generalist approach to, to pharma investing. But as far as I can tell, I think it's always going to be something that's going to require specialist support because of the uh, careful approval process that's required. And I don't know actually, I mean, further to this, I don't know if I can actually mention it, but there, I do believe there's a, a sort of a big m old uh, pharmaceutical lab that is being turned into exactly <coughs> this because obviously there's certain specific requirements like hardware and safety and you know not anyone can start messing around with gene sequencing apparently. So can I add to that? So I actually ran before, just after Christmas uh, a program, an accelerator targeting uh, Internet of Things and devices, um, and what we discovered through that process was the three-month approach was it is was not appropriate. And actually what you have to do, I have a, I've been working with a number of people around this, is basically what we call a three month plus another three months. And the first three months is to help you build the product and get to first prototype. But actually that's not far enough along for most investors because the big risk, and you can see this Kickstarter, is how do you go from like your first prototype to your first 1,000 units. So actually being able to de-risk that's really important and working with the right partners is really, really important around that as well. It's if it's a, yeah. if it's got I IoT, internet, connected device type technology, going from one device, the prototype to a thousand, because guess what? As a web technology, your first prototype's your MVP and you can suddenly have 10,000 people test it. That's physically impossible on a connected device. And my point being with Farmer is there will be something called an acceleration program, I have no doubt, but it might not constitute and look like the format of the programs which exist today. And, I, and I, my guess is an accelerator program in Farmer will be 12 months, not three. 
I mean, I think that's, I mean, that's, I think that's absolutely true. Yeah. I mean, we're gonna, I do think we'll see this model. I mean, we've seen yeah. generally that software has kind of, yeah. software practices and software development has often led the, the sort of bleeding edge of businesses. And well, I think we do see that stuff coming, scaling through. The, the, the underlying model, which is an accelerator model, it's really important to understand this, is if you rewind the clock 10 years, the barrier to entry was capital. So I'm old enough to remember 2000 and I was party to a startup and our seed round was $25 million. Yeah, that's a pretty big barrier to kind of compete against. And what's happened is we did some math and to do that same startup today would be about a million dollars. But if you kind of align that and basically say there's kind of smarts and then there's capital, the smarts actually haven't changed, but the capital has completely fallen through the floor. And so therefore the importance at a really early stage of the smarts versus capital is proportionally much, much larger. Now if you look at other industries, you can see exactly the same thing. And the reason why hardware and connected devices is happening in the same way is the cost of doing hardware is starting to fall in on that trajectory. And there are many other industries which are doing that, and so therefore the barrier is, is no longer the capital to get into market. It's actually to do with actually the accelerator, it's the connected people, it's the networks. Those things are becoming more increasingly important at a seed level. The thing I would point out is when you get into a growth phase, you still need a lot of capital. And you can see that a really good example of that is Facebook. Facebook absorbed a huge amount of capital to be able to grow during certain parts of its system, but we are talking about at the very earliest stages. It's such a, it's such a key point and often forgotten about not only, I mean, I, I worked for a company and we spent <coughs> 20 million pounds trying to take on Google and mainly because we had this gigantic server room. Uh, you know, it was all air cooled and 99.9% .9 of it was never used, but you know, we built for scale because we were effectively spending Simon Cook's money, so we thought, why not? Um, <laughs> um, any more questions? Oh, yeah. Just off of the question regarding the accelerator for healthcare, a pharma, there's a program called Healthbox. I'm yeah. not quite, I can't quite remember the details around it or the duration of the program, but definitely take a look at Healthbox. Okay. So I just kind of to throw it out there because, yeah, I didn't remember. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very helpful. We like that. Uh, any more questions at all? I warn you, if, if we don't keep getting some questions, I'm, I'm going to get you all to stand up and I'm going to start embarrassing you and I'm going to make you practice pitches in front of them and I'm going to literally... So it's really in your interests, I think, unless you are a dedicated, true entrepreneur who wants to pitch in front of these fantastically smart and intelligent people who, who I think have discovered my social network for cats. Yeah, Carlos has obviously found the link to my site. Cats. Cats. Found some cats for you, Ben. Yeah, it's a competitor. <laughs> <laughs> it's a competitor. Hi. Um, you say you have uh, thousands of unsuccessful applicants. Do yeah. you offer feedback to each applicant? No. No? Nah. <laughs> How can you meaningfully, Fact, I guess? Like, I mean, I, I go from, we had 1,302 applications for 10 slots, yeah? And we had to select them in three weeks. So I effectively go from 1,000 to about 100 in about a week, and then 100 to about 25 in another week, and then I have 25 to 10 in another week. How I, about I can give feedback to the later stage ones, oh, so okay. like in the last 25, yes. but it's impossible. Um, look, bluntly, the, the 1,000 to 100, it's just shit. Sorry. <laughs> I mean, I, I think that it's, it's a valuable question to ask, and when we went through starting Seed Camp, um, we realized that the European ecosystem was at different levels in different countries and that there wasn't a one-size-fits-all solution and that having just a simple sort of X-factor-like thing where you come and you meet us and then we make a decision was not going to be constructive for the European ecosystem. So our program is built around an events model. So we go to cities and like what's going on today is our seed camp week. It's the end of our seed camp week. It is the process of evaluation of which companies will get investment, but the companies that have gone through this week are getting free feedback. So you're pitching every day, you're getting mentoring every day as if you were already in the program, and at the end of it, you will get 
admittance into the full long program. It's like an iceberg. You see a little bit. And the reason why we constructed it this way was because we knew that we weren't going to be able to accelerate the European ecosystem as a whole if we just left the doors closed for those the companies that we invested in. We had to open it up, at least in part, to everybody who is, is, is trying to do something meaningful. And we do that continuously in the same location year after year, and we see the huge change. Like from the first time I was in Slovenia to now, you know, like the, the growth. And the same guys who tried one business, they, got, they went through the mentoring, they might have changed their mind because they didn't get selected, but they still got all the mentoring. They said, you know what? I can see now why this idea was flawed. Let me go back and try something new with all the feedback that I got. And then that time around they get in. So it, we do behave a little bit differently than the traditional sort of format, but it's because it's tailored for what we kind of assessed the situation was here. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, I was just going to echo John's, uh, yeah, depend on the stage. So there's a usually initial sift on these. You start getting down to a few. But, uh, I mean, we've put the application process first part as a video online. So, you, you know, we're not asking for reams and reams of application forms, business plans, financials, and what have you. So, you yeah, know, you get... A decision, unfortunately, at the end of the day, that might not get any feedback, but it should enable you to, um, yeah, to at least get that on there, and you have some for the future. And are there are there any sort of, you know, common mistakes that that, that these people could kind of avoid? I mean, you know, aside from spelling, grammar, too long. Uh, uh, you know, if you if you depend on the application, read the application guidance. You know, if it says three pages, keep it three pages. If it's a one minute presentation, a one minute presentation. The amount of times that just gets ignored it, it is amazing. Yeah, and most applications, I would imagine, have something about why us, why our program. Take that question seriously, so <laughs> do your research. <laughs> um, and, you know, if you're applying just shotgun approach to, like, 10 programs, it really is obvious. So take some time and um, apply to the ones that are really a fit. Don't just do the shotgun approach. It's like, just, a, it's like a CV, isn't it? You know, when, yeah. when we were applying for jobs, you know, 10 years ago, we were given the advice... Don't just, you know, send the same CV to every single person. I completely agree with you. I think a, a, a video or a pitch video of two minutes or even just an introduction video of you and your team will absolutely make you stand out versus just somebody else's bunches of words that they've applied online. I, I think anything that you can do to make yourself stand out. Personally, I would always advise that if you can try and physically meet somebody from the team and just go, look, I've applied. I'm really excited about it. Love to be able to talk to you about my idea. I recognize you're probably very busy, but somebody who's made that effort to come and meet you personally always makes a big difference as well. So what you're saying is you have this huge pile of, of, of sort of cat social networks. And if I want to, to stand out, I should either send you a cat or I should meet you. I mean, are you... I mean, it sounds a little bit like, John, that you're almost wanting to get rid of hundreds of thousands of applications. You know, no, I want you to make, yeah, it, no. I want you to make it easy for us. Yeah. Uh, make, make, make the effort to come and meet us because that I don't want them to life. meet me. A thousand people at my front door is just not going to be fun. I um, a actually, I'm going to reflect back to what Carlos said earlier, which is this idea of getting referrals is really, really valuable. Yeah. So guess what? We publish all of our mentors on our site, yeah? Um, and one of the secrets of our current batch is of our 11 teams, eight of them came through referrals, yeah? So it's not you come to me, you would go to Carlos and say to Carlos, I know you know John and you know me, can you just put in a good word and send them an email and just say, we've spoken to such and such. Those are the sorts of things which rise your application through the system. And you're more likely to, even if you don't make the cut, you're more likely to have somebody spend a little bit more time looking at an application. So you have to hustle, yeah? And you have to find relationships and connections between yourself and myself or Carlos or any of these teams. That stuff really stands out, and, yeah? And not only just to get in, but it's going to help you build your business regardless, yeah. right? So <laughs> it's a good it's, skill, it's a, period. It's a core <laughs> skill of an entrepreneur, which is if it's a customer... If it's a partner, if it's an investor, these are all like, much as we talk about if this as being, and this is another thing that Carlos said, this is not about technology. Actually, technology is a people business, yeah? People write code, yeah? And all of those things that actually happen, and the ones which are really successful 
are because of individuals and how they interact and work with other people. Yeah, it's not. I mean, if you look at Zuckerberg, much as there's certain things I hate about Facebook, the way he grew that business and the relationships that he built and the recognition of like when I, he needed to step aside and bring in smarter people to support him was really, I think, was profound. And that was the value that came through on Facebook. Awesome. We always like a good Zuck story. I think mm -hmm. there's a few of the guys on the panel that actually need to go. Oh, well, they so can't. They can't. They have to stay. <laughs> stay? Uh, I, let's, let's face it. I think I'm pretty much everybody... I'm going to build that cat network. <laughs> so John's yeah, no, going to go and build really nice. a cat network with Ben. Mm. Carlos needs to get back and judge some amazing startups for Seed Camp. Diane, I, need, I know, needs to get back to Mozilla. I'm obviously going to stick around. I don't know whether um, the guys yes. from... You, can you collision? Yeah, can, you yeah, can yeah, stick yeah, around. So if there, if there are any other questions, please do come and get us. Obviously, there is another thing I need to do. So um, a bunch of you applied for a fast track process through to the next stage of Wira. I had 15 applications over lunch, so well done, guys. Um, I'm delighted, so I'm gonna choose two of you, not just one. So, Linda and Pablo. Well done, guys. So, you guys have absolutely embodied what we asked for, which was you, you've hustled, You've met people, you've networked, you've learned stuff. Um, so congratulations. We will see you in the next round of wire applications. If you take a seat, I just want to say thank you to our wonderful panel as well. And I know Ben will say the same thing. I think it's very rare that you get to see this many people from different accelerators all on the same stage. So I know you're all really, really busy. So from Wira, thank you for joining us. No problem. Um, and guys, that's it. That's 16 hours of content you've sat through over the last four days. And you've done it with absolute passion and, and genuine commitment. So thank you so much. And genuinely, good luck to all of you. Thank you, Anne. I think I'm just going to very quickly recap what I think I've learned this week. And, and one of the things that I, I do think is really important about, you know, if you're thinking about starting a business or you have a business, I've been doing startups. We love you, John. We love you, Carlos. Bye-bye. I've been doing startups, I've been working in startups since I was 18. I've done every single job in a startup. I have been shit at uh, quite a lot of it. I have been awesome at some of it. Even to this day, even though I know investors and accelerators and, and people, and I'm very well connected, and I'm very lucky, and people support me, and I can probably do almost anything, I would still, if I was starting a business, apply to an accelerator because... It doesn't matter how much you know or how much you've done before, or, or like, you still don't know anything. Like you just don't know a single thing about your business, and that's the entire point of a startup. A startup is not a business plan. A startup is not an idea of how you're going to make yourself rich. It is literally a thing you are solving day in, day out. It is just a series of problems you are trying to fix, and you don't know the answer, and that's fine. And every day you wake up and you think, I don't know what I'm doing, what am I doing? And you go to your email and you, you email someone and you say, I don't know what I'm doing, and you hope that that will fix it. Or you try and find someone, you try and hire them, you try and recruit, you try and build. There are days where I stare at code and I don't know what I'm doing and I think I, to myself, I am awful at this. I am so bad at this. Why am I doing this to myself? Why don't I just go and work in Marks and Spencers and sell prawn sandwiches? Why am I putting myself through this? And it's a lonely, scary, horrible thing, right? It really is. Trying to build a cat network that people will actually use. Trying to get cats to use a keyboard has been very challenging, Anne. Very difficult. But I think I would still apply to one of these fantastic incubators and really do understand to yourself that it's okay to not know. It's okay. All you have to do is forgive yourself. Realize how beautiful you are for even attempting to do these things. And I urge you to spend as much time as possible walking around these stages, talking to people, getting their business cards, networking, doing your elevator pitch, hustling for money. Never, ever give up because otherwise you'll end up walking for some gigantic corporation. You'll hate yourself deeply to your bones. And we don't want any of you to go and work for a corporation because you're all better than that. A Churchillian speech there. Nice work, friend. Nice work. And also... 
Ben's been here all week helping us. Honestly, couldn't have done it without you, Ben. Thank you so much, darling. Yeah.